So, uh, in the previous times when I've spoken at this group, I usually talk about something technical. So my ambition this time was to not be too technical. Um, basically, I want to answer the question of why might you even use lazy programming? Um, and by lazy, I mean languages like Haskell. Um, and so the example that I've chosen is both a, an example that I use um, in my personal life, some of the things I do personally, and it's also an example that um, I'm quite confident would not be possible in a not, or not possible, I mean just intractable, in a non-lazy language, it's just, you're never going to be able to achieve it, even though they're all Turing complete languages. So basically I'm going to talk about, I do a, a fair bit of work with maps, um, and the reason I do things with maps is because I often find myself in remote environments doing all sorts of things, and this here is my device that I use, it's a Garmin 60 CSX. <coughs> and uh, the thing about the Garmin 60 CSX is that it's a 12 channel GPS receiver, so I know exactly where I am, down to some pretty, pretty good accurate measures. And using that data I'm able to also create track logs. Um, so <coughs> the reason I use the Garmin 60 CSX is because sometimes I find this rock, um, it's a 1,350 metre rock in South East Queensland called Mount Barney. Um, I've done it seven times now. Um, I went up uh, two weekends ago and it was absolutely pissing down and I didn't go all the way to the top because there was water gushing down the hill as I was walking up it. So I turned around and went home. <laughs> and that's what you see when you get to the top, by the way. Um, I don't know if you've ever driven along Mount Lindsay Highway, but that's Mount Lindsay right there. And Mount Ernest just beneath it. Mount Lindsay's 13, uh, 1150 metres, so I'm about 200 metres higher than that rock there. And Have you climbed Lindsay? I've never climbed Lindsay. Do you want That's to? why I'm still here. Do you want to? <laughs> Pardon? Do you want to? Uh, I do, yeah. You done, Lindsay? Alright, we'll hook up. Come and see me. Okay. And the other thing that I often do is I often, it's a dark there, but I often ride a motorcycle. For example, what I've been doing for the last three days um, is riding my motorcycle beats Mondays. So, um, yeah, sometimes I'm hooting along the track and I like to know where I am. Um, and I, I found myself one day in a forest um, in north of Brisbane. Um, I've, I've done a few of these in, you know, big tall trees and I had no idea that the sun was blocked out by the clouds and if you had asked me where the north was, I would not have been able to tell you. And I look in my fuel tank and it's dead, you know, nearly down the empty and I started cracking myself. And so from that day on I said I'm going to get a decent GPS, and there it is. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, like I said, I've spent the last three days riding, um, and probably can't see that, but this is a topographic map of um, Mount Barney. Um, this is the Mount Barney East Peak, which is from where that, that photograph was taken, and the photograph is looking that way, you know, Lindsay's down the bottom there. Um, so this is one of the tracks that I often take up, and so, you know, you're puffing away and you want to know how far away it is and it's actually that far away and you go, well that sucks because you know, you're looking straight up at the thing. This is good, I'm getting all your beat <laughs> <Yeah>. at you. <laughs> and uh, so, <clears throat> uh, this map is actually um, open source data uh, provided by a, a project called OpenStreetMap which I think is on the next slide. Yes, so OpenStreetMap is a, it's, you know, it's a planet wide collaborative wiki basically and any one of us can go right there right now and enter data um, which has a really good benefit um, where you might get that data from is like you know track logging on a, on a decent device um, so you know I've been up and down a few tracks and I get home and I have a look where I've been and I'm pretty pretty damn sure there's a track there um, the downside to that is that anyone can enter data and occasionally you'll get a spammer who's gone and drawn their company name as a bit of grass or something like this. It's pretty awesome actually. <laughs> pretty creative spam, I thought. <laughs> so, um, once I've got all this data, um, what do I personally want to do with it? Um, I want to take this OSM data, the OpenStreetMap data, and I want to convert it to run on this device, and this device is running an OSM map. Um, it must be accurate. I really don't have much tolerance for inaccuracy in my map data. I must be able to see it when I'm doing 130 through the bush on my bike, and I, it must be able to be used in a, in a remote environment. Like I must be able to be you know, on Mount Lindsay or wherever I might be, and I must be able to have this accurate data 
available so that I can rely on it. And and also I hate spelling mistakes. You know, someone goes and puts this data in and screws up the spelling. I just have a real thing about that. <laughs> However, um, this Australia Australia and Oceania, so that's um, out to Fiji and up to Papua New Guinea. That's three gigabytes of XML. Right. Pardon? Everybody's playing with it. Yeah. So, well, yeah. So, yeah. You can see the goods and all the bads about that. Um, the, the question, obviously, is can I parse this three gigabytes of XML and replace the spelling mistakes and, you know, all, all the, you know, I'm going to do a lot of stuff to this data before I put it on that device according to what I want it to do. And I, I want to be able to do that in a way that, um, first of all, is efficient. It's, it's going to do it before I go to leaf to climb this mountain or whatever it might be. And uh, I need it to be composable, right? So I need to be able, I need to separate the parsing from the, you know, my operations. Like a good example is someone spelled street without an R, right? I want to replace all S T E E Ts with S T R E E T. So I want to have this little function over here that's just string to string, and I want to I want to just want to go plug it in, go, and out pops my my process data. So can I do that? And three gigabytes. So there's a technique of parsing. I don't know how much you've looked at parsers. I know I've talked about monads before a few months ago, but there's another abstraction called an arrow. Um, so uh, there's monadic based parsing. I think we've done that as a group before. So there's another way called arrow based parsing, which gives you different benefits. Uh, one of those benefits is that it will work on this data, whereas monadic parsing will not, um, just because of the sheer size of it. So essentially, I want to be able to read in this data into an immutable object graph. Um, not consume memory. I don't want to, not three gigabytes of stuff in memory. Um, and I wish to be able to apply functions to this object graph to, to, to produce um, you know, a, a transformed object on the end. The answer, the question is, can I do that? So just to sort of get a little bit technical um, in terms of <clears throat> how it kind of might look, I'll just, an example is if you think of a latitude and longitude, which is like a point on the, on the Earth's surface, have that pair and just call that a node. And we'll just say that this data type here is either it's a way, meaning it's a list of nodes, like a track, so a list of lat long pairs, or it is a node itself in that it's like a point, you know, like here's a street light or you know, whatever it might be. And uh, so we'll just call this our our open street map data structure. So this is this is like a simplified version of, you know, basically I'm reading in this XML into this great big list here. Um, but it's not consuming three gigabytes of memory when I do it, and it's composable. So <clears throat> um, that was a sort of abbreviated one. But what I've done here is I've pulled out the real code from a um, from the OSM parser that I've written, and um, it's you know it's a bit lengthy there. It probably doesn't need to be, but I'm just being a bit honest, I guess, because this is really what it looks like. Um, you can just see, you know, this is the the node element. XML node is a node, and um, these two functions here wrap and unwrap it um, in terms of going from a triple into a node. So that's the lat long in the this other data structure. Let's not worry about that. And then how do we get that back out of the node into a triple? So that's just two functions, and the reason I've used these two functions is because we've got a we've got a way of parsing for triples. And the way to parse this triple is to look for the attribute for that's LAT, the attribute LON, and then this, this, uh, that other data structure I've also had to go and write a parser for. So that's calling on that parser. So it's relying on this code underneath it. So that's essentially how you write um, an arrow based parser using a library called HexD. And um, if, if you have a look at the actual OSM data format, it's a bit more complicated than the one that I showed you. But that's essentially what it is. And I've built up a parser on top of that. And it allows me to do what I need to do to my gigabytes of XML, someone else's gigabytes of XML. I was going to run a demo, but I have no idea how to run an OSX machine, mate. So every time I touch it, it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'll just show you the demo. It's pretty easy to read. I'm, I'm not joking. It really does break every time I touch it. So this is this is an example that uses the um, the parser. Um, and the reason I wrote this this um, this particular example is because a friend of mine once said, "How do you get all the campsites out of it?" And he sat about, sat down to write this great big Ruby program. I said, mate, I'll get all your campsites and I'll email them to you. Um, so basically, <coughs> um, each node in, in an OSM data format has a key value pair, 
um, a string and a string. Um, and campsites uh, have, the, have the key tourism and the value is campsite. And um, so basically I'm taking all the nodes. So you read this composition by the way, this is function composition. You read composition generally from right to left. So I'm taking all the nodes and from each node I'm filtering out all the ones that have tourism equals campsite. And I'm calling that function P. And then I read in, so here's the file name here. But, um, I read in that file into a great big data structure. I apply this function, that is I get all the campsites out of it, and I print them all out, and then I email them to my friend. That's it. I mean, that's, that's pretty, that's how I like writing programs. I don't know about you guys, but I love it. So, <clears throat> um, mostly because it works, not because I love, like loving it, but anyway. So there's another format. So aside from OSN, there's a format called GPX. Um, um, stands for GPS Exchange Format. You probably maybe heard of it if you've ever used a GPS. Um, you might have heard of KML from Google Earth. So GPX is like a like a non-Google. It's like it's an open one. Um, and and uh, so th this particular device track logs in in uh, GPX. So when I get home, I've got a bunch of GPX files um, that say where I've been. Um, yeah, it's used almost universally by GPS devices. Um, and yeah, GPX in general contains Waze, which is a list of nodes. Uh, that's wrong. Sorry. Waypoints, which is a node. Tracks, which is a list of nodes. Routes, which is a list of tracks. And metadata about the GPX. You know, like I decided to go fishing at this location. Whatever you want to type in there. So. Um, there's, I've done the same thing. GPX is an XML format as well. Um, so here's just another example. Um, it's just a little bit more involved, this example. So if you can just imagine a GPX file being, you know, where you carry your device, where you've been, what, where you've marked all your points, um, and you want to do something. In particular, you'd like to get your minimum and maximum elevation in your, so, GPX has, has the ability for elevation, and some devices have a barometric altimeter in them, so this, this one does. It tells you how high you are. Um, whereas if, if you've ever used like a more typical GPS, it will give you an altitude, but uh, it's, it's coming off the GPS signal, so it's not very accurate as opposed to an altimeter. So basically when I get home, I've got a pretty, pretty accurate altitude in my device. It tells me how high I am. Um, so I want to know how, you know, how, why did I slob all the way up that hill? How, how high did I get? So basically, I, again, function composition, right to left. I read in a list of GPX files. I get all the waypoints out of them, which is all the marks. And then uh, I get all the elevations out of the waypoints. And I have to do a little bit of a data type conversion here. It's an easy list. Then I use this, this little narrow combinator here. Then I get the minimum and then I get the maximum. So they're library functions from that elevation. And it gives me back a pair of doubles. So this particular function here, that read GPX files, is the one that's relying on the XML parsers. So underneath all that is, is that same XML parsing stuff that's working on, on a GPX format now. And ultimately, the result of me writing that parser means that I can I can now do this, which I think is neat. All right. So that's going to work, and that's what I care about. So, um, yeah, so just to sort of finish off a bit um, with, a, with an example in a minute. Um, not really an example. So uh, the other reason I use a lazy programming language, um, so this is getting away from parsing now, is, uh, is for writing geodetic al algorithm. So um, the Earth is approximately an ellipsoid. Um, it's not quite an ellipsoid. Some people will... Not like me saying that, but anyway. Um, so um, accurately computing the distance between two points on an ellipsoid is not a trivial task. Um, it's just not. Um, it's, a lot, it's a lot of um, geometry involved. Um, as a result of this difficulty, some people just say, well, you know, screw it, it's a sphere. Um, and there's the code, right? <laughs> Easy. Um, that's called the great circle distance. And, uh, you know, some people use that for navigation, depending on you know, depending on how much accuracy you, you need. Um, I've got a touch of OCD. I like, I like accuracy. 
Yeah. I'll write the code. <laughs> Just a touch. They haven't told me it's any getting any worse. <laughs> so there's another one called the have sign formula, which which is you know has has similar to the GCD algorithm in that it's it's inaccurate but really easy to write. Um, I think it's even shorter than that. Um, I have it somewhere. Um, so and, and there's another algorithm called Vincenti's formula, which are two two related algorithms in that one's the inverse of the other. And uh, basically, they compute these two. Or, you know, you give it the two points and it'll give you back a distance um, and a bearing because your bearing changes as you go across the ellipsoid. And the other one is you give it a point and a bearing and it'll tell you where you'll, en you'll end up. So the reason I'm going to show you this next slide is because I don't want you to read the code on the next slide, but I want to show you just how difficult it is compared to that GCD algorithm in that footnote there because <laughs> this is the Vincenti direct algorithm. Um, so just, that's just sort of to give you an idea. So that, that's, um, those numbers here are related to the size of, this, of the ellipsoid. So they're, they're Earth numbers. Um, oh, actually, no, they're not. No, I take that back. They're actually an argument to the function. That's what that E is. That's the ellipsoid there. So this function here takes a, a coordinate and a bearing and a distance. So it says start from here bear here for this for this long and it'll return you a coordinate and a track bearing so your bearing will change as you go across the ellipsoid um, so it returns that pair so as you can see that's a little bit more involved than the uh, than the GCD algorithm um, and just to sort of stay on the same roll here there's the inverse algorithm um, I'll just scroll down there for you so that's the inverse algorithm so did you write that? I did. That, that took me a day and a half to write those two functions. <laughs> so this function here takes two coordinates that start in the end and returns the distance between the two and the azimuth. Um, so, yeah. This is not a particular reason to use a lazy language. You can go and write these in whatever language. Good luck to you, because I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'd rather write it in there, in Haskell. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. So that's one thing I use Haskell for. How did you test those functions? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, one's the inverse of the other, right? So I can just go. I can. <laughs> <laughs> one's correct, and I can check the other one is. You wouldn't. You wouldn't, mess up, you wouldn't mess up exactly the same way twice. No, well, to be honest, what I really did is I took someone else's um, Java or C Sharp and I put in some values and I said, you get these values and so do I, and I'm good to go. <laughs> and, and sort of verifying bits of it uh, along the way as well. Yeah. Did you, I know you added some Geo stuff to Scala set, but did you end up yeah. going as far as implementing these functions? Can't Interesting remember. to see how, how big they are. I'm pretty sure I, I, I if, if, if I understand myself correctly, I sat there and said, nah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going I'm to bet that I didn't. I bet I thought about it and said no. Because I can't see I myself can't going any further. Yeah. Maybe I did. I don't know. It's, have it's you got Scala Z on here? We can yeah, have a look. Yeah. All right. That's a good question. I mean, because like I said, I. Well, that's not a good reason to use a lazy language. That the, the algorithms are not specific to lazy languages. It's that parsing that is. Yeah, separate geo package. We do. Yeah. What have I got in there? Uh, uh, it looks like you got the bits. Um, it will be a method on something on uh, ellipsoid maybe. Oh no, that'll be. On cord, try. Oh, actually, now that I think about it, maybe I did. Oh, hang on. Jeez, hang on. Yeah, oh, I did. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I did. Uh, once I wrote the Vincenti formula in Scala, and there's a reason I've forgotten all about it. Find the curve. Let's see worst. So is the input into the GPS the OSM seven dollar? Uh, no, it's it's actually this is a Garmin specific format, so I actually take that data and I convert it to a Garmin 
So there's like this pre-processing that I do on the ISM data, and then I convert it to the gun specific format after that. Yep. Okay. Dude, you're scaring me now. <laughs> cool. Cool. So any Thanks questions, on. guys? Yeah. Um, you're saying that the dynamic files is going to handle those big input files. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. Duplicative files is you can get more sharing. Yep. Is that the same reason with the arrow based files? Uh, yeah, that is the reason. So you can use like a. Yeah, you would run out of memory. Yeah. I don't have a good concrete answer to you for you, but I've found that it runs out of memory. It's been a while since I've read it. Something about backtracking. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to write a backtracking file with one else. Any other questions? Does that make sense? It wasn't very technical, right? Yeah. Tony, are you, you going to be putting that that Haskell library? Is that something you'd be doing? Ah, yeah. So it, package? it is on Hackage. Yeah. So the name on Hackage is called OSM, GPX, and GADT. Yeah. Enough of using the GADT. That works, man. <laughs> well, I'm sure it does. <laughs> 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 big time. I'm on One is the inverse. Maybe I'm on a web service or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that. You know, they're on Hackage. Okay, thanks guys.